But here we are. We are now joined by Tajin. Did I get that right? It's Tagen. Oh, you pronounce it with the hard G. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Tagen. Cool. How you doing? You right? Cool. Yeah, I'm all right. I was having some like troubles with my camera. The way it was displaying was like super pixelated, so I had to fix that real quick. Yeah, that's um, cool. I have those problems all the time. That's why I'm like five minutes late to all my shit online. <laughs> you think yeah. I would learn? You think I would learn by now and just start a little earlier? But alas, <laughs> whatever. It's almost impossible to start early. Do you mind if I ask you where are you calling in from today? Yeah, so I am in the city of Rancho Cucamonga, California, which is about an hour outside of LA. Okay, cool. Are, were you like born and raised around there? Uh, around here, yeah. Okay. I was born in San Diego. Um, okay. And so is it the place where you are now? Is it like a suburb or what? Yeah, it's it's interesting because it's it, because of its proximity to LA, it's I guess a suburb in its own right, but it also is like a part of like it's not a suburb of LA, but it is like a part of the LA metro still. Um, okay, but it has like a suburb feel. Yeah, it has a suburb feel, but they're turning it into a more urban environment, especially as they're like starting to build new complexes um, all around. And mm. do you like it there? More- I like the location of it. Um, it's as far as SoCal goes, it's one of the more beautiful parts of it. Uh, not nearly as many warehouses as you'll find uh, if you go further, like east. Um, but I, I do enjoy it. I, I spent a few years here as a kid. Um, my mom worked literally like uh, two blocks from where I currently live. So, it, you know, I have a, a lot of fond memories of this place. So, Okay, right on. So when did you start writing a lot on the internet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't really know if I ever started writing a lot on the internet. I still don't write that much on the internet. Um, but well, I started... you, you're, you're fairly well known, at least among a small set of people on, I guess, yeah. on Twitter, I guess on Twitter primarily, would you say? Is that your main go-to place? Um, Twitter and Facebook. I have an Instagram. I just never use it. Um, but yeah, Twitter and Facebook. I feel like I'm known by more people on Facebook than I am on Twitter. So are um, you one of those people who write like long theoretical monologues on Facebook posts? N- no, surprisingly not. I sort of get irritated by those people because half the time it's like boring nonsense that like no one <laughs> should be forced to read. Um, See, my, my beef with Facebook and like writing theory and stuff like that on Facebook is that you, you don't know who it, they're going to show it to. And that really upsets me. So yeah. I find that I, I can never invest thought or time or energy into writing like quality content on Facebook because I get, I bubble up with anger and frustration thinking like maybe if I spend an hour on like a really high quality post, they're not going to show it to people and I'm not going to know. And, and, you know, I don't like, I don't like that lack of control. Now, obviously Twitter is just as bad with deciding who gets to see what, but if you write everything on a blog then, and only share it through Twitter, then you know you know the blog is going to be there. You know readers of the blog are going to see it if they're signed up to read it. And so yeah. yeah, I'm I'm very averse to writing high quality original content on Facebook whatsoever. Yeah, I have some friends who share their like poetry almost exclusively on Facebook, and I I just think that's the wrong platform for that kind of stuff. Yeah, I tend to agree. I mean, I have no judgment against it, but I'm more just I feel bad for people who create work and put it on Facebook because who knows what kind of uh, hole it's being stuffed into. Yeah. <laughs> no. So, Facebook. so ha- maybe you could describe for us your intellectual interests. Let's say kind of your, your portfolio of, of interests and your, your intellectual background. Could you, could you do that for us briefly? Yeah. Um, and like, this is a really interesting thing for me because I don't know if you know, I'm 19, right? Okay. Um, I, I, I could tell you were young. I wasn't sure how young. Yeah. Um, and so, like, I'm tutoring the Lizen at 19, um, and that's not something that you normally find, right? Um, so I started reading theory when I was probably, or I guess, like, what people call theory nowadays, when I was 12, I think. So it's been about seven years for me now. Uh, I started 
reading Marx just out of pure interest. I had some idea of what socialism was and was like, oh, I like the idea of like the redistribution of property and those sorts of things. So let me read something on those topics, right? And so I bought, um, of course I bought the Communist Manifesto and I also bought uh, the Contributions to the Critique of Political Economy. Um, and I remember reading in the preface of the Contribution to the Critique of Political Economy, it has one of the most like brilliant introductions to Marx's thought that like you could ever find in just a single page. And I was just awestruck by it. And I was like, I, I know I have to like contribute some part of my life to this. So I spent like two years reading Marx, reading commentaries on Marx. Um, I had come across the reading capital text and uh, through that I was like introduced to Althusser and Zizek and is this any better? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if it was just me, but um, all of a sudden you sounded like an experimental noise musician, like running your voice through like crazy garbled noise. It was pretty yeah, I intense. Just got, I just got pretty, some pedals over here. It was pretty intense. Do you know? Do you do you know what might have caused that? Um, I don't know. My bandwidth maybe was a bit too high. Okay. Um, my upload speeds aren't too great, so. Okay, yeah, hope, hopefully uh, it won't happen again. It was, like, pretty brutal, to be honest, but, uh, it's, I mean, things happen. It's no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> so where do I leave off? Um, so you can carry on. This. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I spent, like, two years reading Marx, reading commentaries on Marx. Um, I'd come across the text Reading Capital, uh, and through that I was, like, introduced to Althusser and Zizek, um, I had started reading, Zizek has this uh, collected works that he edited called uh, Mapping Ideology, I think it is. Um, and I, I came across that when I think I was like 14. That was the first time I ever like read a text of like Althusser and like Lacan and like a lot of like big name thinkers, right? Um, and so like I, as much shit as I'll give Zizek, I'll, I'll credit him for at least like introducing me to these people. Wait, now, um, how do you even get exposed to that when you're like 12 years old? <laughs> I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out on a limb. I know, I know nothing about you, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and guess that at least one of your parents is a professor. Am I right? Um, no, you're kind of close. My mom is, she's currently working on her doctorate in psychology. Uh, I think she's, her focus is, uh, industrial and educational psychology or some bullshit. I don't know. She's a capitalist. Well, good so to be on the show. Real um, respect for your mother. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, no, uh, she currently works as the like head of HR at uh, a community college system in San Bernardino County. Okay. Um, and so like she, you know, knows academia really well. She's not a professor on herself, but she's involved in academia. Um, but does she have like copies of A Thousand Plateaus lying around the house? She she doesn't. She really doesn't know who they are. Um, okay. Every time, <laughs> I remember being a kid, and every time I'd ask her to buy me a book, she would instead of like use letting me use her card, she would make me use my debit card because she was like, I don't want the government tracking me. <laughs> so how, how do you then get exposed to? like high abstract political theory stuff when you're 12 years old? Um, I don't, Amazon? <laughs> but I mean, frankly. what even got it into your head at something like, what What even presented it in front of you? Uh, like Deleuze, for instance, like how, how would you yeah, get into Deleuze um, when you're like so a young for, teenager? For Deleuze, I think I was about 14 or 15 when I started reading him. And I was, I remember I, I was in ninth grade, uh, my second semester, I switched schools because uh, my mom kicked me out. <laughs> um, and so when I switched schools, uh, the text that everyone was reading in my English class was uh, Antig Sophocles' Antigone. Um, and so I remember reading Sophocles' Antigone and I was like, whoa, this is like a really interesting text. And so I came across Judith Butler's um, text on Antigone. Uh, and so I, I read that just out of pure interest uh, after having read Antigone in class. Um, and I was talking with my instructor about it and she was like, oh, well, have you talked to um, this other instructor on my campus? And I was like, no, I, I've never spoken to this person before. 
And so I go start talking with him like two hours into a conversation later, I bring up that I'd been reading Althusser um, and that I was really interested in like Antigone and all that stuff. And he's like, well, have you ever heard of Deleuze? <laughs> and I was like, I think I've seen that name in passing. Uh, and he recommended some like secondary texts. I think he recommended some like Hart and Negri um, to me to like start reading alongside reading Anti-Oedipus. And I think I picked up Anti-Oedipus on Amazon like a week after that and just started reading. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. So, I mean, that's cool because I mean, when I think back to when I was 14, I was just like skipping class and skateboarding and like jerking off, jerking <laughs> off and shit with my buddy. Uh, so, I wonder how much smarter I would be if I started reading Deleuze when I was 14. That's cool yeah. though. No, actually, honestly, I was reading Ayn Rand in like high school. Okay. That's, what I, that's what I was into. I would, yeah. I, I would like go to Starbucks um, to get away from my family and I'd read like Ayn Rand books. And I would think I was so fucking smart and like above <laughs> everyone else. I was like, like all these fucking people around me are just losers, like scrounging off the welfare state. But I'm like a, I'm like a lone genius, and I'm gonna like prove to the world that I, I can like produce everything. That's I remember thinking that and skateboarding and like being kind of just like an anarchist punk kid. Yeah, and see, like for me, I, I. I never would have thought in high school, even while I was reading the Liz, that like I would actually care to like devote my life to it or anything. Um, I I always wanted to be a physicist. <laughs> like I loved math. I took two years of calc in high school. I you know I studied physics and chemistry so much. I'm like in love with Ilya Prigogine. Um, and uh, I like loved Gattari because of his focus in non-equilibrium thermodynamics. And so like, I, I always was interested in like the science aspect of things, um, but I tried doing that and I hated it after like a year of actually trying in academia of <laughs> doing anything like that. Um, so do you so mostly- it's like maybe this- Go on. Sorry. No, no, just like maybe I just thought to myself that like maybe this isn't the right uh, venue for me. Right. So you dropped out of, of university, as I understand. I think we talked about that before. And yeah. you are a tutor in Deleuze. So how, how long have you been tutoring? Like, do you have how many clients? do you uh, have? I've been tutoring like two years now. Um, I have currently five full time people that I'm wow. working with and nice. maybe two or three that I just meet for like random one-off sessions. Okay. Um, and how do you, how, how did you get hooked up with your clients? Did they find you like your Twitter account or do you know them in real life or what? Um, Twitter, Facebook recommended to me by friends. Um, some people at were like, in school and like that I had someone who's like instructor recommended them to me because I knew their instructor on Facebook. Um, <laughs> so is your tutoring all digital or do you meet people in person? It's all digital right now. I would be open to the idea of meeting people in person, but there's not too many people in like the world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, digital is easier really. Yeah. It's easier to schedule. It's easier to go to. Yeah. I hate actually going to LA. So <laughs> Cool. Okay. That's nice. Uh, and um, okay. So maybe you could help us understand uh, for people who don't necessarily know Deleuze or aren't necessarily interested in Deleuze and since you, you tutor in Deleuze, why don't you tell us what in your view is most interesting or valuable to, to Deleuze uh, ab about Deleuze that, that someone might not know or understand if they're coming into this fresh. Yeah. Um, well, I guess I'll talk a little bit about what I found really interesting when I was like 14, 15, right? Um, I remember I I tried reading Antiochus and I just couldn't get through the second page. I was like, what is this nonsense? You know, it talks to, you know, it, it heats, it breathes, it eats, it shits, it fucks. I'm like, I, I have no idea what's going on here. Um, what, what the fuck is Judge Schuber's ass doing in this page? Like, who the fuck is Buchner? And like, you know, I don't, I don't get what any of these references are bringing up. So I, I instead opted to read the anti Oedipus Papers, a uh, collection of Gattari's work that he was writing around the time that Antiochus was written. And it had a collection of his diary entries. And it was a really interesting text for me. And I, I remember reading through it and you find 
passages where Guthrie describes that, you know, he says things like there are only two types of politics. There's Oedipal and revolutionary. Um, and like being introduced to this new schema of, uh, uh, you know, the, this this idea that, you know, there, there is no distinction between the inside and an outside of an object. And uh, being able to approach ontology in this way that, like, doesn't essentialize, like, attributes and characteristics to objects. Um, one thing that really stuck with me, of course, like, uh, uh, I was reading Sophocles and, you know, Antigone and uh, uh, Oedipus are, you know, huge resources in the realm of uh, psychoanalysis. And so I had this, like, really interesting perspective on, like, I, I had already been, like, developing my own relationship to Oedipus um, in the, without knowing that, like, Freud, this is what, you know, Freud was doing, this is what Lacan was doing, this is what everyone was doing. Um, and so like being introduced to this non-edible psychoanalysis uh, that, you know, I, I, I use non-edible in like the L'Orealian sense, um, right? Uh, uh, it was something that I hadn't like possibly conceived of before. And I, I had been in therapy for three years at that point already. And like, I knew I was depressed and I, you know, I knew I suffered from mental illness and, being able to like cope with that in some way. Uh, not not saying that, you know, that doesn't get that idea are just self-help books, but it really does help you, you know, um, to have some way of like conceptualizing of mental illness that doesn't pathologize. Um, uh, and I mean, e even calling it mental illness, I guess is, is wrong terminology there, but. Uh, yeah, okay. And what, when people, do you, do you tutor on Deleuze and Guattari uh, or other things also as well? Yeah, so I tutor primarily on schizoanalysis, but I also I feel comfortable tutoring in French philosophy from after World War II to about mid '90s. Um, I have a pretty solid grasp on that area because it's that's my research. So um, I also tutor in uh, Afro pessimism, uh, which is not something that many people request, but. Um, that's something I offer. Uh, okay. And what, 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 what about Afro pessimism do you most appreciate that other people don't understand? <laughs> um, that it's not Afrofuturism. <laughs> um, because I have a lot of qualms with like the study of Afrofuturism. I think first and foremost, it's just not even like a real thing. <laughs> there, there is no, no such thing as Afrofuturism <laughs> to me at least. Um, it makes no sense to lump together. For me, I remember reading Mark DeRay's uh, like uh, originary paper on Afrofuturism, the term, where in the same sentence, he connects Sun Ra to uh, Parliament Funkadelic. And I just remember reading that and being so confused because I'm like, these are two people who should never be put in the same sentence. Like they are two completely different projects with two completely different aims. Just because, you know, George Clinton puts a black man on the moon doesn't mean it has anything to do with Sun Ra's Saturn. Um, Sun Ra would call Parliament Funkadelic just planetary nonsense. <laughs> um, and so my um, I love Afro-pessimism for being able to produce an affirmative critique of the Western conception of blackness. Um, because for me, what I find most interesting about Sun Ra is that you find this affirmative blackness that, you know, in, in like Nietzschean terms is active, right? Um, it, it's not this like uh, a passive blackness that can only be de described in terms of like, the other to whiteness, right? Um, and so in Afro-pessimism, in Sun Ra, you find these two conflicting conceptions of blackness and uh, the only sort of resolution there is to be able to affirm this new conception of what a black individual is. Um, and yeah, I mean, being, you know, Afro-Latina, um, 
I, I find it really important to be able to conceptualize with my own blackness in a way that isn't reliant on anything external. Hmm. And so would you say that Afrofuturism and Afro-pessimism are not just distinct, but at odds? Are they kind of mutually exclusive to some degree? I, I would say so. Um, because to me, Afrofuturism is not... I mean, it, it is not a conception of, of Black invention, right? Uh, a white, you know, English professor, literature professor came up with the term. Mm. Um, you know, uh, it has, to, for me, it has nothing to do with Blackness in any affirmative way. And it really just lumps together anything that has to do with Black people and technology. That's really right. it. So you what know? did you think about the recent Black Panther film? I didn't see it. Oh, no? You're yeah. Just, you, you have utter <laughs> contempt for the very idea of it, or what? Um, I don't like to support mainstream films just in general. I think the theater is just not a place to go. Mm. Um, I haven't been to a movie theater in God knows how long. I think the, I, the, I've seen like one film in a the theater in the past two years. And it was the new Grinch because Tyler the Creator did a lot of the music for it. <laughs> so, <laughs> are you are you a big fan of Tyler the Creator? I I'm a moderate fan of Tyler the Creator. How about Earl Sweatshirt? I'm more of a fan of Earl Sweatshirt than I am Tyler the Creator. I loved his new album. Cool. Any any thoughts or interesting Deleuzian takes on Earl <laughs> Sweatshirt? Um. Not particularly. I, I think, especially in his new album, uh, something I find interesting in a lot of musicians that I would sort of lump together with the Afro-pessimist tradition is that they employ this atemporality that you find in Deleuze and Gattari, right? Um, and not just an atemporality, but an asubjectivity. Um, and these aren't things that you can normally conceptualize of in any like meter-based music. Um, and something I really like about his new album is that like the meter goes away entirely when I'm listening to it personally. Like I really do, like Gattari has this passage in uh, Chaosmosis where he describes listening to a single note of Debussy. And he says, when he listens to a single note of Debussy, he's transported into another universe. And he, he leaves his existential territory and you know opens up another plane of possibilities, right? He approaches the plane of consistency and all that nonsense, right? Um, but uh, in a very unironic way, I, I understand completely what he means. And I feel the same way when I listen to Summer Earl <laughs> Sweatshirt's new album. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, nice. There's a question in the chat from Charlie Looker, which is a good question. Are you into Fred Moten and do you see connections with Deleuze? Absolutely. To both questions. Um, I love Moten. I haven't had the chance yet to read his um, consent to be a singular or consent to not be a singular being. I haven't read it yet, but it's on my list for starting next month. I just, you know, I got to buy it first. <laughs> um, uh, as you can see, I, I don't have a bookcase in my apartment yet because I'm still rebuilding my library. Um, but uh, no, I, I'm a huge fan of Fred Moten. Okay, so I have a question for you uh, that just came to me. A lot When you read Deleuze and Guattari, one thing that stands out is they're extremely not woke. It's actually kind of, it's actually pretty funny. It's actually pretty funny if you read it a lot and closely, they're actually extremely unwoke. They say lots of things that nowadays, most people would never read aloud in a, in a university classroom. And so that's an interesting little discussion point because I'm curious, I'm curious what you think about that. You know, one of their most famous or one of their more famous concepts, I should say, not most famous, but uh, you know, they have this famous concept of becoming woman. They talk about, they talk about races. I was actually just working on something in a thousand plateaus and I came across one of the, there's a line where they literally say, you know, to something like I'm paraphrasing, but to become imperceptible, which is, you know, a good thing in their universe, one has to purify one's race, <laughs> um, something like that. So there's all this kind of very, very, uh, not woke stuff in there. How do you interpret that? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, obviously, just to start, you got to kill your masters. <laughs> um, you know, no gods, no leaders. But uh, 
Uh, no, seriously. Um, I mean, if you look at even anti Oedipus, right, you have the, the civilized capitalist machine, <laughs> like, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, as opposed to uh, the, the Asiatic and, and despotic <laughs> machines, right? Um, no, I, I honestly just think they can be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, so is that how you interpret? Do you do you see traces of racism and sexism in them? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And um, so, in particular, becoming woman, the stuff about races is your over is your overarching take that 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 is basically just traces of of misogyny or or racism. Yeah, um, I, I I'm conflicted with regards to becoming woman because I I do understand it from the position of even a woman must become a woman, right? I understand it in those terms, but when we extend it into the realm of reducing the woman to this state, which I, I think they do in many ways. So real um, quick, before we get into the weeds on this, what, could you tell people what this idea of becoming woman means and, and, and why it's important? Yeah, um, and so so in the Liz and Gatari, we have the, the concept of the molar and the molecular or the major and the minor. Um, right. Uh, the, this is not something that uh, is in quantity, bigger or smaller, but it's something which uh, holds within itself a, a larger potential for acting and a larger ability, capacity to uh, enforce itself. Um, and, and that's what you find in the, the major or, or the, the majoritarian uh, position, right? And so they have this idea that the revolutionary stance uh, belongs to the minoritarian, right? And so in order to sort of, uh, uh, in order to be a revolutionary, you must sort of undergo a certain set of processes which uh, uh, effectively turn you into a minoritarian subject um, uh, or minoritarian uh individual as uh mm -hmm. not to get into a complicated discussion about individuation but um uh that was well put that was well put so yeah so you could carry on to tell us why because a lot of people make the argument that it's not sexist at all that you know there, there's a way to reconstruct it that is actually quite feminist actually quite um sympathetic to to women's liberation so uh, i would I'd, I'd love to hear your 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 uh position on it yeah, and and see when I see like uh, and forgive me if I'm mispronouncing her name, but uh, Rosie Bra Bradadotti or Bradotti, uh, I think you know who I'm talking about, right? When I see her talk about becoming woman, she she presents a really great critique of it um, that I can't go into because my memory uh, fails me sure. right now. But <laughs> she presents a really great critique of it uh, in a text of hers um, that I share a lot of the sympathies with. Um, and in, in the way that she presents becoming woman, I, I get it. I get how it has feminist implications. I get how it, it does truly subvert any sort of like patriarchal invocation of the woman. But in the Lizen Gatari, we I think we find a very problematic application of it. Um, particularly with terms, I, they extend it in, in the same sentence or same paragraph, they say, you know, a, a woman must become a woman, a Jew must become a Jew, and a black must become a black, right? That's mm. that's the three things they say in a row. Mm. Um, and they don't clarify. They don't, <laughs> <laughs> they don't say anything more than that, right? So it it has a lot of ways that it can be very easily read in like a racist, anti-Semitic, like misogynist way. Right. Um, because they just say that and then they don't, they just move on. I mean, I think um, the, the sympathetic reconstruction of that is that when, when they make those kinds of categorical, absolute imp kind of imp imperative or directive statements, what, what's usually implied is that one needs to fully traverse something to kind of pop out the other side in some sense. Yeah, and I get that, but I, you know, to to deal with it, and I think that we can deal with these three: the becoming woman, becoming Jew, and becoming black. Right? I think we can deal with these three in the same uh, sentence because they're invoked in the same way. Um, in Mbembe's critique of black reason, right? We 
he introduces this concept. What is black reason? Uh, it, it, it's the, the principles, laws, institutions, powers set up to constitute race, right? Um, and what precedes that is always that one must have either a conception of race that is, you know, predominantly held by most Western metaphysicians that, you know, you, you construct blackness by uh, uh, a negative to whiteness, right? Um, or you could have this, you know, super liberatory position on blackness, of course, but that's something that you won't find in a, a white subject. I, <laughs> uh, the losing got the knee, we're not writing from a black perspective, you know, the losing got the knee, we're not writing as women. Um, they were, I think, in many ways, uh, assigning like a revolutionary potential to something which could only be like constructed if like you take like a reformist position and not an abolitionist position hmm. um okay that's interesting so what do you think that's it. just because i mean by all indications neither deleuze nor guattari or as you so elegantly say Gattari, uh <laughs> had, by by no indications did any of them have uh any tolerance for sexism or racism and you know uh Gattari is much more kind of organized and and invested in activist circles and feminist circles anti-racist struggles you know Deleuze was always very adamant uh supporter of the Palestinian cause you know you see lots of different yeah. piece, lo lots of dis different data points like this so I mean that's not to say that there can't be traces of sexism or racism in their work of, of course there there still can but those data points do kind of push up against the interpretate your interpretation that you're that you're kind of putting out at the moment, which is that those kind of baldly kind of racist or sexist sounding statements that that we should just kind of take them at, at face value. Like that seems to be uh, uh, implausible to me. So clearly like there has to be clearly that there there must be some kind of ulterior reading of of these seemingly racist or sexist statements. And so I would be inclined to try to figure out what is that more generous or charitable interpretation. Yeah, um, you you could read it in a way where if we deal with these not as identities, but as minoritarian subjectivities purely, mm -hmm. then we could have a, a, a clearer conception of this as not having to deal with an actual woman, like they say, are not having to deal with like actual black people, but but just this this concept of the woman, um, <laughs> you know. Um, but I I find it very difficult to separate the two. Sure, sure. Do you read the stuff about faciality? They have all these concepts about, in particular, the white face. Is this kind of uh, key? conceptual persona that that appears in Deleuze and Guattari. A, a lot of people like Charlie Looker is mentioning this is also in the chat right now. Uh, a lot of people interpret this as a very kind of anti-racist uh, perspective. Do you interpret it that way? Or is the what is the use of the color white there kind of just incidental? I, 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 I get why the white is invoked, particularly in relationship to Guattari's invocation of the black hole. Mm -hmm. So there, there it makes sense to me. Uh, but do you because think they it, have, do you think they're using white white face and black hole with kind of racial connotations? Because if so, then it, it would that that could be read as a kind of anti-racist uh, bit of work because you know they're generally uh, unsympathetic to the white face and they're generally um Although they're they're not very sympathetic, I guess to the the black hole and the white face are are both problems for them primarily. They have negative yeah. charges, but the white face as a problem, I always kind of interpreted that at least as as having kind of implicit, kind of almost anti-white, anti-racist kinds of uh, connotations, but do, maybe you don't see it that way. I, I I think that the concept of faciality in general does have many uh, uh, anti-white implications. And it's something that you even find in like Fanon, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so it's not, uh, you know, that of course I, I, I can't argue with, um, but uh, 
I, I don't think the invocation of, when we deal with uh, the black hole white wall distinction that they present, I don't think that has anything to do with race, quite frankly, because okay. Gadadi was tr truly, sincerely, sincerely, sincerely interested in uh, uh, like the <laughs> real dynamics and physics, so. Okay, okay. Uh, well, maybe that's a nice segue then, because you, you said earlier that that was one of the things you were most interested about or most interested in. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that. What is at stake here with respect to these kinds of, uh, you know, the nonlinear dynamics and complex systems? What what do you think Deleuze and Guattari see about that, that that's really unique and valuable? Yeah, um, this is something that for Guattari, he takes almost entirely from Ilya Pyrrhogini who was a Nobel uh, laureate chemist. Uh, 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 you know, wrote some of the greatest text on non equilibrium thermodynamics, which I won't be able to give like the best explanation of, but uh, effectively when you deal with systems that are like out of balance, um, where you have, uh, th there's like a classic diagram where you have like a two, two humps like uh, on a graph and like one hump here, one hump, higher up and you have a ball up here that wants to go down here. And so dealing with like the dynamics of how that ball will like somehow move over, um, even though there's no like force pushing it. Um, and so like, you know, th there's a lot of really uh, cool things going on uh, like mathematically in it, but there's also the implications of um, Priogini wrote a text with uh, Isabel Stingers titled uh, Out of Order, Out of uh, Chaos, or Chaos, out, Order Out of Chaos. There we go. <laughs> um, and that text is sort of like a simplification of a text of Priogenes that he wrote with uh, someone whose first name I forget, but last name is Nichols. Um, it's called uh, Self-Organization in Non-Equilibrium Systems, I think. Um, and in that text, which I cannot comprehend the majority of yet, I'm I'm working towards it, but it is very difficult chemistry. <laughs> um, um, but uh, one thing that Priogenin brings up in the conclusion of the text is that he believes that this concept of self-organization in non-equilibrium systems has in direct implication into the social. Um, and so uh, one thing that Gattadi was working on was looking at self-organization, looking at autopoiesis in the physical sense and seeing how that could be manifested in the social, how that could be manifested in the subjective, right? Because for, for Gattai, the radical subjectivity is subjectivity, which is founded on its own basis. It's affirmative of itself, right? Um, and so, um, you know, in, in like for, for Nietzsche, right, it, it's it's the the uh, noble morality or whatever he calls it, uh, as opposed to the slave morality, um, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, this this concept of self organization, this concept of autopoiesis, um, is what is crucial to both Priogenin's work in thermodynamics and to Gattadi's later works in schizoanalytic cartographies and in uh, three ecologies and chaosmosis. Okay, that's that's a, a good rendering. I think for people who have never read uh, Deleuze and Guattari, now when I'm saying that, you make me want to say the proper pronunciation <laughs> of, of Gattari. Uh, it's like, I can say Deleuze and Gattari, but I always just feel like such a kind of uh, faking like white male, uh, like Englishman. Uh, when I when I say that, so I usually just go for like the the just admittedly bad uh, phonetic uh, English pronunciation. But now I'm like thinking about it each time I, I say it. Anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with I'm gonna stick with my uh, my my own style. Um, uh, for people who have never read Deleuze and Guattari or have not who, who know absolutely nothing about them, I think that the simplest way to kind of summarize what you were just saying is that at the core of their project seems to be something like an interpretation where all of society as we know it is, it consists in these pathways or ruts in which the, the, the virtually limitless creativity and possibilities of human beings get kind of channeled into particular ruts 
um, that that then become reproductive of themselves and they become incre increasingly entrenched and kind of uh, stabilized and self-reinforcing, but in a way that often constrains uh, what is then possible for us to think or do, but that there is a way to uh, kind of model how this process works and that if we can model this process with sufficient uh, rigor and accuracy, then we can kind of uh, reverse engineer the the diagram, as it were, and in that way find how to basically free up and liberate our kind of creative potentials uh, to kind of unlock our creative potentials from from all of these kinds of channels that that seem to so insistently and deeply and kind of almost primordially kind of channel us into kind of status quo circuits. So they're very interested in basically how to unwind that and 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 liberate people from that. That's at least my interpretation. And so, uh, you know, I think the connection to uh, complex systems and nonlinear non dynamics, uh, the way that you kind of just described it makes a lot of sense from that perspective. Yeah, definitely. And I, I always read uh, those in, the, in many ways to have affinities with uh, Raul Vanikim, whose name I don't know if I'm pronouncing right or not. Um, who yeah, wrote I've never uh, pronounced that either, but yeah, famous situationist <laughs> theorist, yeah. kind of representative of the, the 1968 moment. Yeah, um, right. And, and he wrote the, his beautiful text, uh, The Revolution of Everyday Life. Um, but I, I'm always reminded when I'm thinking about the Lysengathe politically of a text he wrote called uh, From Wildcat Strike to Total Self-Management, right? Because um, he introduces this concept of total self-management, um, where there's not just management of the, the workplace, but a management of every individual's own life. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he, he invokes this idea that we should have the we should have a right to the free use of space and time, <laughs> right? Um, which is something you find in like all of the situationist texts, right? You have this new concept of uh, urbanism where sh we should be able to mo uh, change a building simply by walking by it and all of those things. But um, <laughs> you know, I, I think that this this self management is really central to Deleuze and Gattari politically. Um, mm. And so I, there, there's a, a large affinity for me between self-management in the sense brought up by Vanikiam and uh, uh, self-organization as brought up by Priyogeni. Okay. Yeah, that's an interesting connection. You definitely can draw a straight line from the situationist currents to kind of Deleuzean, Guattarian perspective, for sure. They're definitely kind of swimming in a similar culture, very kind of uh, lib libertarian, anarchist, socialist kind of... Uh, tendency. So yeah. yeah, I think, I think that that's useful. And I think, uh, that raw rule person, I also, I think I've literally never even had any need to even try to pronounce the guy's last name, but, uh, <laughs> that Raul person, uh, he's, he's quite underrated. I think he's underread. Um, oh, the, absolutely. The, his book, the revolution of everyday life. I, I, I think, I think that's the title. I think I got that right. Uh, yeah, yeah. quite good. It's quite good. Um, a lot of like the situationist stuff is is pretty hard to read. Well, not, I mean, like the Guy Debord short books are obviously pretty easy to, and fun to read. But if you ever try to scroll through the, um, the, the more like arcane situationist writings and correspondences and stuff like that, um, it's like, it's got a lot of pretty bonker stuff. Like Guy Debord was a bit of uh, a sociopath, I think. Like he was, he was a very strange person. I mean, I don't, I don't know too much about him, but the way that they kind of ran their organizations was, it was, was very, uh, very strange. Without going down a big rabbit hole, all I'm really trying to say is that uh, I always thought that Guy Debord is basically a bit overrated as a theorist, and and that Ra Raoul guy is um, underrated uh, as a, as a thinker of that of that moment. Yeah, I mean, the board's biggest issue, right, is you know, Situationist International came out of the Letterist, right, um, and with the Letterist, we have as I or Isu. Uh, who's made one of the most beautiful films I've ever seen before, right? Um, however, he was basically a cult leader, and the board kind of falls into like the same trap of just like replacing him. What was the most of... beautiful film you've ever seen? Not the most beautiful film I've ever seen, but one of the most beautiful films I've ever seen. Uh, Isidio Isuz, uh, who was the founder of the Letterist International, which precedes uh, Situationist, right? Sure. Um, he made a film uh, called uh, uh, Treatise on Venom and Eternity. Uh, 
Oh, really? Cioè, te, cioè te de bave e eternite. Uh, um, the bave technically translates to like throw up or spittle, but uh, no one actually says that the name is the treatise on spittle and eternity. They say venom. So, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So, so that's not the most beautiful film. What is the most beautiful film you've ever seen? Elias Suleiman's Mukadima. What does that word mean? The title of, of the word? <laughs> uh, it is, it's the same word as like prolegomena. Okay. So like I've never I've never heard of it. So um yeah, it's just it's just the Arabic word for prolegomena. Okay, cool. Those are some good leads. Uh, I'm always looking for recommendations of interesting stuff. So when I first when when we started this conversation and I first asked you how did you first start writing on the internet, you kind of punted or dodged the question a little bit and <laughs> saying that you know you don't really or you're not you're not that big a deal, but at least a few <laughs> at least a few people who follow my stuff. Uh, know who you are and and follow you and they 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 affirmed the proposal that someone put up of of having you on the show. So I'm always interested in people's backstory. Like surely you must write on the internet enough that you have some kind of uh, intellectual persona that that people like. So just help me understand that and help me understand that story. Like what? I, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I get what you mean, and it's kind of interesting because like I really I. I've not published anything yet, <laughs> you know? I, mm -hmm. I have a blog that I've only updated maybe seven times, you know? Um, I, the only like real blog I updated was my art blog where I posted like art every like four hours for like a few months. Um, and I stopped doing that even. Um, so my interaction with social media has mostly been on the one hand through my art practice and on the other hand, just through random Facebook groups and group chats that I get added to and networking with people who, you know, I might make like a casual relationship with uh, just purely based on likes and replies on Twitter. Um, so what, what would you say you're known for on Twitter? How are you perceived? Like what's your, what's your, what's your conceptual brand? <laughs> I'm known for being a Catharian. Okay. I, I think quite frankly, I'm, I'm known for that. I'm known for yelling at people all the time <laughs> and getting in a lot of fights. And okay. Yeah. That's, okay, interesting. That's... <laughs> I, I, I find it very interesting. Young people such as yourself who kind of cultivate a intellectual persona on, on the internet and, and, and write in different ways. But as you said, don't ne haven't necessarily yet published anything particularly notable. I'm sure that's just because you're young and because you're still, um, you know, it, things take time or whatever. But I think it's interesting how in a way that your generation, people kind of coming up now, kind of, I think, understand the internet better than people in, in, in my generation, because what, what a lot of people in my generation don't understand, and I'm just a millennial basically, um, but even just my generation, what a lot of people still don't understand is that on the internet, you can kind of bootstrap yourself into being something. <laughs> I don't mean yeah. any respect by this whatsoever. I, I, I'm impressed by it and I, I admire it, but you can kind of bootstrap yourself into being something on the internet without necessarily having done any particular accomplishments uh, in, that, <laughs> in, in that area. But if, if you if you do have what it takes, if you do have the interests and the enthusiasm, and you're able to put just the energy into putting yourself out there, then in a way it's legit because what you're doing is you're you're kind of signaling and proving to people that you do have what it takes, that 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 you are the real deal. Even if you haven't accomplished anything yet, you, you can still you can still kind of signal to the world and prove to people that you are the real deal. And and I think you're kind of a really interesting example of that. Like you're obviously um, very precocious. You're, you're obviously, you know, very, uh, well-read and, and thoughtful and, and educated about the theorists and topics that you're interested in for your age. You're, you're obviously, um, way above average and you're very promising as, as a young intellectual. I just think it's cool how you can basically put yourself out there as a public intellectual without ever having accomplished anything. No disrespect. <laughs> um, no. And, and it, and it kind of works. And, and I think you're kind of doing the internet, uh, right in a way. <laughs> I'm kind of like winning at the internet. Yeah. Um, 
No, I, I don't take any disrespect by it. I, I constantly say to my friends all the time, like, I haven't done anything <laughs> yet. My first text is coming out in a journal that I don't think anyone will probably read uh, that has no history yet. And they just invited me to publish over my email. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah. And I mean, the yeah. fact that you're tutoring, for instance, like I take that to be kind of a, a very interesting detail. And in, in what I was just saying before about how you've kind of bootstrapped yourself as, as a uh, kind of intellectual authority at, at the ripe young age of 19, because, you know, the fact that you have paying clients uh, paying you to teach them these different texts and, and concepts and philosophies that people are interested in, you know, that's, that's an accomplishment in some sense, you, you know, you are doing real work and uh, clearly people must respect it and value it enough to, to pay some of their hard earned money for it. And so it, it's, it's impressive that you've been able to bootstrap yourself into that type of position and, and paid work without necessarily having the accomplishments, but then ideally, you know, you will keep thinking, you will keep working, you will keep, and, and then who knows what kind of writing, you know, achievements are ahead of you. And so you're kind of like a hyperstitional uh, intellectual, if you will, you've kind of like hyperstitioned yourself into um, being what hopefully you will become. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that's an interesting way to put it. Um... Well, that is, I guess I'm assuming that you do have, um, do you have writing aspirations, kind of like productive intellectual yeah. aspirations be further? Yeah, I mean, I you might not. I'm not necessarily imputing them to you. You know, no, you know, no. maybe, maybe no. the real future of the intellectual is never writing anything uh, <laughs> at all, and you're just kind of like tweeting all the time and teaching concepts that you've never written about. I mean, I'd love to do that. I'd love to be like the new media Socrates. But <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think that's too realistic. Um, so, what are your yeah. goals then? I do want to write at some point more like long form things. I I just find myself coming to roadblocks quite often. And I think part of the issue is just I'm young and it's hard for a 19 year old to feel confident in writing theory when it's like most of the people doing this are like almost twice my age and like feel like they more read well read than me. Cause they, I mean, you know, they have like twice as much the time to have read this stuff um mm -hmm. but then i like think about it and i'm like well i do kind of have like a graduate school education in this i just don't have the degree to show it you know um because i mean seven years is a long time to spend at something um sure sure yeah but you know what older people often don't actually have time because they've sold their time and energy to like some large institution that actually makes them work like a dog full time doing like non-intellectual stuff, you know? So yeah, there, there are weird, there are weird advantages, I think to being young, to being out of the system in any way, because in, in a lot of ways, like the people that look like they're occupying like the most privileged positions of, of intellectual power and possibility, they're actually the ones uh, deepest up to their neck in like bullshit distracting work that actually sometimes forecloses um, a productive and, and significant creative intellectual life. Yeah. And like, I really want to write a text on Sun Ra because there's only one text I can think of that's ever been published on Ra that isn't his, besides his biography, there's only been one text published on Ra that actually deals with him. That doesn't, I, I honestly hate, um, what, what, whatever the name of, uh, uh, Fuck, his name, his, I know his initials are EK, um, but I forget his name for some reason. Um, but uh, th there's a black intellectual who wrote a text on music and jazz and uh, in invoked Sun Ra. And I, I just think it was bad. I don't like the way that Sun Ra is dealt with in academia. And okay, so, so I, tell us why, why should people care? about Sun Ra? Why should people like Sun Ra? What, what is it about Sun Ra that people don't understand? So for people who are unfamiliar with Sun Ra, Sun Ra is a black intellectual and uh, musician and composer who founded the tradition of, I would say founded the tradition of cosmic jazz 
And I use that phrase very selectively. Um, but uh, in this tradition, there is a basic premise that Sun Ra proposes that humans are doomed. The earth is dying. There will be no future for humans. Check, check, check. Probably. Right. <laughs> um, and, I mean, it, it's very Nick Landian in the nothing human will survive the near future, right? Okay. Um, uh, he he kind of goes full meltdown even from like his first year where you know he starts to put out things like nuclear war where the lyrics are just about how uh, <laughs> um, everyone's gonna die. <laughs> Um, and the basic premise is that Sun Ra is someone from Saturn. He's evidence that things from Saturn can be transported here. And he's here to prove to humans that other types of worlds are possible. And right? how literally does he mean this, do you think? I think he both 100% believes it and he means the more metaphorical implications of it. Okay. okay. So I, I I think he he's one hundred percent serious about the story and also like everything that you can imply from this, like conceptually, is also true. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good answer. So go on. So why why what what is so kind of unique so, and, and valuable about his his perspective? Yeah. And so we have this idea of of like so so he, he he claims that in him just being alive and acting in any way he proves that other worlds are possible and he believes that his music's purpose is to prove that other words other worlds are also possible that's cool um, i like that and and so in doing so he believes that he must strategize a plan in order to let humans escape Earth. Now, on this part, I do not believe he is serious in the sense of humans must actually leave physical Earth. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think okay. what he means is that we must put behind the idea of Earth and replace it with a new Earth in Deleuzian terms. Uh, um, I see. Okay. Uh, like they bring up in what is philosophy, uh, the new Earth uh, and the new human. Um, one one is also tempted to draw Christian parallels, the idea of the, the, there, you know, a new heaven and a new earth. There are Christian parallels, and, and Sun Ra does invoke Christianity quite often, but in a very in a Sun Ra fucks like the authors of the Bible the same way that Liz fucks Nietzsche, you know? <laughs> um, um, from behind. From behind. <laughs> um and so um, Sun Ra, I love Sun Ra's answer to the question, how do we get off Earth? Because he says, any scientist who thinks I'm going to use gasoline has not understand, understood me correctly. Hmm. The way he's going to transport humans off of Earth is through music and through sound. And I, I find direct parallels between this and Sun Ra er, er, and Dalas and Gathai in uh, of the refrain, right? Mm -hmm. And in Gattari's text on the refrain, he published before and after, because um, the refrain is a conception of Gattari's, not Deleuze's, like some people think, because mm -hmm. some people think Gattari never invented anything. Um, but uh, uh, no, this this concept of the refrain that's so central to Deleuze and Gattari, and th this idea that the refrain has, I'll, I'll pull up the passage from A Thousand Plateaus, actually, because it's my favorite passage in the whole text, um, where they say, um, the refrain also has a catalytic fun. Or, 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 I'll read from the beginning of this paragraph. So, what is a refrain? A glass harmonica. The refrain is a prism, a crystal of space time. It acts upon that which surrounds it, or sur sound or light, extracting from it various vibrations or decompositions, projections or transformations. The refrain also has a catalytic function, not only to trans, not only to increase the speed of exchanges and reactions in that which surrounds it, but also to assure the indirect interactions between elements devoid of so-called natural affinities and thereby to form organized masses. The refrain is therefore of the crystal or protein type. And I, I love that passage because to me, I, I read it entirely as affirming Sun Ra's thesis. Like it 100% affirms the thesis that the way to transport humans off of earth is through sound. Um, yeah, I can definitely see that connection. That makes perfect sense to me. So, okay. So 
That's interesting. And do you think Sun Ross succeeded in his goal or did something happen to cause it to fall short? He did not succeed. And the reason he did not succeed is because I 100% the reason he did not succeed is because people fucked him over. Hmm. People stole the rights to his music. People stole things from like his, his mini moog was stolen from him. And like all accounts of Sun Ra were that after his mini moog was stolen from him, all life from him depleted. Like <laughs> um, he died not too soon after his mini moog was stolen from him. Hmm. Um, okay. Interesting. And, like, uh, I, I sincerely believe that just humans fucked Sun Ra over and did not give him the true respect he deserved. They didn't take him nearly as seriously as he should have been. Um. <clears throat> okay. If you don't mind me changing gears, uh, just a question just came into my mind that I'm curious about your your view on. Are you Since you mentioned Nick Land before, are you familiar with Nick Land's reading of Deleuze as basically to be very cartoonish and simplistic about it, Land seems to think that Deleuze basically loves capitalism and that capitalism is like, yeah, you know, this uh, beautiful deterritorializing function that is is basically the engine of liberation. Yeah. Um, take and what do you think of it? So I'll say to you the exact same thing I said to Andrew Culp on this topic, which is that I do not sincerely believe uh, Nick Land read A Thousand Plateaus all the way through. <laughs> Why do you say that? Um, because in A Thousand Plateaus, they directly address the things that Nick Land takes too seriously about the list. Okay, right? go on. In Anti-Oedipus, they say all the things about, oh, you must accelerate the process and, you know, you can only go further. You must go, in order to, uh, you know, go beyond capitalism, you must go through it. They say all of that stuff in Anti-Oedipus. And then in A Thousand Month Days, they go, wait the fucking second. That's not what we meant at all. <laughs> um, and so what did they mean in your view? To me, they mean that there are things within capitalism that must be developed before any post-capitalist reality can be accomplished. Okay. I, I think as far as building to scale, the ability to produce, oh, overproduce uh, food, the ability to uh, uh, develop distribution networks that function e efficiently. Um, I, you know, I think capitalism is great at doing that. I don't think that the way in which distribution actually occurs is great about capitalism, but I think that capitalism has developed the, the, the networks in order to be moved through for any post-capitalist reality. But I think that those things were developed 50 years ago. You know, I, I don't think that that's anything particularly new. I don't think that that's anything we need to wait for. I think that the things that we need from capitalism are are done okay now however they are very against protesting or objecting they tend to see in political activism <laughs> and and these different forms of trying to organize against capitalism they're inclined to see a lot of resentment and resistances that ultimately get further entrapped by let's just call it capitalism or the institutions and so they definitely seem to have a quite uh, kind of anti-activist edge to them. W would you agree with that or, or would you reject that? I'm inclined to say I agree. And the reason I'm inclined to say I agree is because they, I, I read them in the same way Andrew Culp does, that they are advocating for withdrawal from the machine. They are not advocating for any type of reformism. The revolution they're calling for is not political, or is not is not macro political. Right. Um, you know, they they are not advocating. Um, I mean, Gattari directly is not advocating uh, total self management as much as I want him to. He he has written text against self management, and he's written text against at least like in the political sense, he's written text against self management and against wildcat strikes, and he really doesn't like anarchists for some reason. Um, but also, that's mostly his early stuff when he was still a Trotskyist. So you know, who knows what he thought in his late life? But um, so um, you you think they're not cheerleaders for capitalism? in this kind of 
very cryptic hidden way, but rather they, you, you would agree that they're, they askew all kind of current forms of traditional political activism or organizing for the most part. So what does a, a, a Deluso Gatayan po politics look like? Everyone you ask is going to give you a different answer, so I can only answer for myself, right? Yeah, they're very, they're very <laughs> obscure about it. I mean, it's a very big question. Yeah. Um, to me, the Lusakathalian politics is the withdrawal that you find in, like, Colt Stark Deleuze. That it's a type of escape from capitalism. Um, that there, there will be no overthrowing capitalism. There will be no day that we can kill all the landlords. Uh, unfortunately, I don't believe that that day can come. But there can be an ulterior system built within, I, I believe, the urban metropolis. Um, I, I sincerely believe that networks can be produced, that distribution can, can begin to occur outside of capitalism without the need to overthrow it, simply because I don't think we have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't What's your take I, on how that if you want to kind of enact a Deluso Guatarian uh, po politics, do you try to organize to force things to change? Or is it a kind of very internal uh, ethics, a kind of uh, a, a certain way of being or living or thinking or or conducting oneself that then maybe because this is basically my view that that it's that it's basically a kind of ethics in which if one orients oneself in the right way and is able to basically liberate one's thinking and and feeling and and acting if one is able to liberate one's energies in other words from these kind of molar entrapments in which they're generally by default uh captured then maybe just maybe we might be able to f find new ways of of interacting and building groups or building relationships that then might somehow be on a kind of vector towards uh, a kind of revolutionary change in in the macro structure but there's no question of of trying to dismantle the macro structure as such in any kind of organized activist sort of way so in some sense one the, the luso guatarian politics i see is um, a certain way of thinking and orienting oneself to the world. But other than that, you can't really force anything. Yeah. Um, I, I agree, but I would only go further. I would say that, you know, to invoke Sun Ra again, because I think Sun Ra describes it very eloquently, that in this effectively revolutionary capacity for music, the goal of any space musician is to spread the music. It's to allow for more people to have that moment where the music allows them to be physically transformed. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that, you know, the, the only thing that can really be done outside of this molecular revolution, it is to not force, but to, you know, it, in a possibly very situationist way, produce situations that allow for more people to have that moment for yeah. physical transformation. Yeah, that that's right. I'm 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 all aboard that uh, take. I think that's right. Um, so one can creatively and autonomously produce new forms of of life, new new arrangements, new ways of of acting or being with each other. But it has to be autonomous, and it has to be basically a small scale, right? Like anything that goes kind of straight to the state uh, yeah. is is kind of off limits, I think, in the in the Deluso Guatarian register. Do you agree? Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I do think that ultimately, there, you know, we, we do have 12 years before the world ends, you know, <laughs> right? Not before it ends, but before we're doomed. Right. So I, I do think that there must be some level of expediency in that building process. But I don't think that there's anything any individual human can do to make that happen. If mm. anything, it will take major catastrophe. Mm. So. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Very interesting. 
do you um trying to think how I, I wanted to kind of bring this full circle back to some of the some of the stuff we originally started talking about with respect to your um just like your your larger like what 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 is kind of the 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 larger question or how should I put it? Um, like what 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 would you say is your main kind of overarching orienting interest or or goal or question intellectually? Like what is the big what is the big idea or big puzzle at the heart of the different authors that you're interested in and and the different ideas you're trying to develop? If there's kind of one big idea at the core of it, what would that be? It, it, at the core of everything that I do right now is the idea that what is currently believed to be impossible is possible. And to explore all of the ways in which impossibility can exist. Hmm. And so I, I mean that ontologically, politically, socially, you know, sub subjective, subjectivationally, you know. Um, uh, I mean, that in all, all senses of production, right? To to explore every mode that is possible, because right that's something that needs to be done. I don't think people realize how important philosophers will be after the revolution. Like, <laughs> okay, right on. Well, I order you to write a book on that as uh, as soon as possible. I think. <laughs> I think. Uh, if you if you write a book on that, you should go write a book on that and then come back on on my live stream and sell it to people. Okay. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. There's no need there's no need to wait anymore, you know. You're obviously, you know, enthusiastic and uh, you know, self-motivated. So, um, yeah, I would love to hear more about that big idea and uh, yeah, I hope you um, I wish you the best in in all of your your future endeavors. Hopefully this live stream will get you some new uh, tutoring clients, anyone out there who's interested in learning more about Deleuze should consider hitting up Tegan for uh, some some lessons. I think you have like pretty pretty affordable rates, right? Oh, horribly affordable rates. Like, how am I making money off this rates? Like, <laughs> no, um, I charge thirty dollars an hour, and if you do weekly sessions for me, then I charge twenty five dollars an hour. And it's not like an hour. I do variable length sessions. So it's between 40 minutes and 80 minutes because, you know, it, it, we could end at 40 minutes. We could end at 80 minutes. I don't know. It's, it's, you have to take it each session at a time. Cool. I think it's cool. I think it, I think I think it's really cool. I, I uh, it was a pleasure to meet you and it was really fun uh, talking with you. I, I really like seeing young people like yourself just out on the Internet, getting after it, saying saying their saying their bit and uh, trying to think through what they're trying to think through. And I, yeah, I really appreciate how you. Um, you're, you're pretty fearless and, you know, basically, uh, you know, putting yourself out there as a tutor, even though you are young, even though you might not have written that much and, you know, uh, saying what you saying, what you think and writing what you think, uh, and not really caring if you have the credentials or the, or the age or the experience to, to back it up, but you're just enthusiastic and you're doing, it. I, I, I like people like you and I applaud you and I, 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 I support what you're doing. And I also, uh, I think we, we actually, you and I actually agree on some, major kind of political dimensions. So I think that what that made it kind of easy and interesting to uh, make the conversation flow quite easily. Yeah, no, I definitely appreciate you inviting me on. I remember when I initially like tweeted at you as a joke, like you should follow me and I'll follow you back. <laughs> I didn't expect you to actually follow me. I know. Um, uh, but yeah, no, I mean, I think it's good for people to put themselves out there. Um, that, I mean, yeah, it's not that, it's nothing too profound. Like I don't, I think, I guess I've had a little bit of success with my different like media ventures or whatever. And so sometimes people think I'm like some, like, I don't know, like media entrepreneur or something like that. I'm, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'm really not like, I'm just, a, I'm just a dude who's like uh, interested in meeting people, interested in strange ideas and people. And uh, for the most part, like if someone hits me up and they're like interesting at all, I'm, I'm pretty much game to, to hear what they're, thinking and hear what they're all about uh so yeah not too much to it <laughs> <laughs> did you have any um last thoughts or uh things you wanted to share with the world that you didn't get to fit in quite yet 
Um, there's one thing that I'm thinking about. I'm trying to see if I can. Nope, I can't pull it up. Um, there, there's a Sun Ra song that everyone should listen to called uh, "Somebody Else's." Uh, some. Hold on. Let, let me let me get the official title. Okay. Yeah, it's called "Somebody Else's World." I'll 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 tweet it so people have a link to it. And what is it? It's called "Somebody Else's World." It's a really great song where the the lyrics are uh, sung by June Tyson, I believe, who's this beautiful uh, female vocalist that Sun Ra uses almost all the time. Um, and the lyrics are effectively, uh, somebody else's idea of somebody else's world is not my idea of things as they are. Somebody else's idea of somebody else's world need not be the only way. Uh, and then two visions of futures, what seems to be may not be what, may not be what is, uh, or something, uh, I, I it's very complicated at that part, so I can't remember all the lyrics, but it's a beautiful song. Um, and it's about the quote unquote adopted source of being, um, because what's central to Sun Ra is this notion of alter being, this idea of like being in a way that is not presently conceived as being possible. And so, yeah. Right on, I like it. Well, like I said, I, I fully expect you to have on the market, a book about how the impossible is possible within a year. There's no reason you can't do it. Just get after it and hit, hit me up. Hit me up when it's ready. I'll definitely read it. All right, cool. I'd love to come on again. Yeah, this was fun. Thanks for hanging out with me. Yeah, thank you for having me. You're very welcome. <laughs> you're, 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 I'm not necessarily rushing you off, but you're, you're, you're free to go uh, from, from here if you, if you want to. There's, there's one question that just came up that I, I'm really keen to. Uh, uh, ask someone about Katie B in the chat says, Justin is absolutely the type of person who broke my heart while I was doing my master's. What does that mean, Katie? I'm very curious if you could clarify <laughs> that. I, 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 I just find that perplexing, but I'm, I'm troubled to learn that I could break someone's heart. Um, but, uh, yeah, anyway, this is where I'll kind of just, uh, do some like post game chatting for just a few minutes with my audience or whatever. So you're free to stay or you're also, uh, you know, if you have to run, you're free to go. <laughs> I, I have absolutely nothing to do. Um, okay. Does anyone yeah. have any final questions for Tegan or for me or for both of us? My grandmother's here, so uh, I should not be too long. In like five, <laughs> like five minutes or so, I'll go down to hang out with my grandma. Okay. Um, I think you're, do you have a partner, Tegan? I do. I think they're in the chat. Oh. <laughs> unless they're, unless uh -oh. it's just some stranger who's trolling. Uh, is their YouTube name Lily Baby? Um, is it? <laughs> um, they're saying, I love my GF. I'm so proud of you, Tegan. <laughs> okay. Are they, is this someone trolling or is this your partner? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Katie B, are you out there? Can you clarify that question? Um, I'd be very curious to... To learn, have you ever? Here's a question uh, from Tales of Ruin. Tegan, have you ever read Moldbug? No. Okay. There you go. Straight answer. Trying to see if there are any other questions. Uh, have you ever, or or rather, it's I guess it's a statement, but um, Charlie Looker says that he heard about you, Tegan, from James Crendel Clark. Uh, yeah. He, he had some collab going or something. Maybe you could talk about that. Um, no, I, I, uh, I texted James after he followed me on Twitter and I was like, Hey, look, who followed me on Twitter. Um, uh, and he was like, Oh yeah, I talked about you and all that stuff. And I was like, Oh, wow, well, cool. Um, yeah, no, James is a friend of mine. Um, we've been on and off talking for like three years now, two years and shit like that. Cool. Cool. Uh, geo pen in the chat is saying in all caps with an exclamation mark, this is not trad. <laughs> <Something>. <laughs> I, I have, I have, I have like a trad wing of followers, I guess. Um, so not everything I think or am interested in talking about appeals to everyone. Sorry, folks. Oh, okay. So KDB comes through with the clarification here. Uh, KDB says, I was quite taken with a very nice bearded theory man who broke my heart up a mountain during my masters and is quite reminiscent of your good self. Oh, okay. So I guess Katie is saying that she was in love with someone who broke her heart while she was doing her masters. 
And I guess that person just reminds her of me. Okay, that makes, oh, more, okay. that makes more sense. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that my beautiful face causes you these uh, triggering, traumatizing uh, memories. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, Katie. But you know what? My beauty is uh, a very, <clears throat> it's a very powerful force, and uh, I can't be, I can't control it. So, uh, all right, Tegan. I think unless you have any other thoughts or comments, feel free to get them off your chest. But otherwise, I think this is a perfect place to end the hangout. And uh, it's been real. So thanks again. I, I have one thought. If Please. anyone wants to read Braudel's Civilization and Capitalism, we're having our first reading tomorrow. We're reading the first 100 pages, but you don't have to read the first 100 pages. Just come. It's on okay. Discord. DM oh, me awesome. about how it. Do you, how do you run that? Um, it's going to be on Discord uh, in the voice channel uh on my private server um or whatever it's called um okay and uh it's just gonna be a nice little discussion about Braudel and i mean he's like super inspiration that doesn't got the um what is philosophy like half of the text is based on Braudel so um and how can people find your discord server uh you can i'll i'll tweet it so just follow me on twitter oh there you oh. go <laughs> yeah <There> you go. <laughs>